Now we're live. Okay. I I I clicked the button to go from the logo to us being on screen. Right. I forgot to click the button to send the stream to YouTube. <laughs> Dear audience, right. we have been live for eight minutes and talking and wondering why nobody was was talking to us. Do you hate us? What's going on? I uh, hate there me. We go. Yeah. 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 Uh, so pro tip, sometimes it is the network cable. Oh, really? What yeah. happened? Like, I just having a really spotty, sketchy internet connection from my, from my computer and uh -huh. I couldn't get the, like I have gigabit internet and I'm yeah. able to get like any of the, any of the mobile devices in the house are getting say 500 megabits per second out of the router but mm -hmm. my desktop which should be the should, is directly connected to the to the internet mm -hmm. should be getting close to gigabit but it yeah. was only getting 100 and every like video chat that i was doing with people was glitching out every couple of minutes yeah, and I, yeah. It, it was happening enough that i'm like okay there's a problem with my internet yeah and then i was like okay great so i'm gonna have to contact my internet service provider i'm gonna have to figure out what you know what's wrong with the internet to profile my internet connection the stuff of nightmares yeah, yeah yeah because you know it's inconsistent and then i'm yeah. like maybe it's my my <laughs> ethernet cable <laughs> and so i unplugged the ethernet cable i plugged in like a, a better quality one that i've got and boom back to gigabit internet speed i don't you'll all have to tell me if i drop but i don't think i will uh yeah yeah and so just like like it's always like the thing that you know it's on the troubleshooting list you know it's like yeah. check out you know swap out your your ethernet cable you're like no it's never the ethernet cable until it is well and i don't know about you but like my ethernet cable there's a good 50 feet for the cable to go because it goes up the wall from the box over one pipe over yeah. multiple pipes through a couple holes that the pipes are going through and eventually drops through the ceiling runs diagonally to the top of my light goes down the light and finally gets plugged into yeah. my computer um and there's a lot to go wrong with that cable yeah, yeah yeah and i do not want to ever have to rerun that cable because it is a maze that the cable goes through it's a fully accessible maze i wasn't trying to drag anything through the walls other than places where like i could look through the wall and and it was fine but <sighs> so when we built the studio uh-huh getting ethernet jacks in all the rooms was a top priority and outside i have ethernet yeah. jacks outside and that I have is jacks amazing out to the garden <laughs> i have ethernet <laughs> so that later on if i want to install some kind of controller or whatever yeah I can, I can through ethernet um and yeah like you know as i was like dealing with the electricians i'm like it's gonna have ethernet right and he's like oh yeah yeah, yeah we'll run ethernet like it's gonna have Ethernet going from room to room from here to yeah yeah no we, you know absolutely we know how to do this like do you need me to get cable do you need me to make what no 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 we know how to do this I'm like okay all right and yeah no they they have giant rolls of Ethernet they they know how to how oh. to run the, the connectors they you know they connect the whole thing so yeah that funny. is absolutely <laughs> glorious thing though yeah it's 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 it's, it's like like if you're gonna build a house make sure you got Ethernet going into every single yeah. room it's the way yeah. We've, we've been adding it in and my studio that we're in a year after remodeling still doesn't have the ceiling finished because we're like, okay, how do we handle leaving access? So if right. we ever need to upgrade the cabling, we can. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so you're <sighs> like prototyping these ways of connecting computers yeah. together before you have to commit and hide them behind drywall. Yeah, yeah. I would... Yeah, I would absolutely just, you know, knock a hole in a wall, run a cable. Like my wife's not too into that. Well, so I we am... have a brick foundation. So yeah, oh. it's more a matter of how do I do the ceiling? And what I'm looking at right now is the wool felt acoustic tiles that uh, are actually pretty and they're thick and they work way better than those white, awful, god awful yeah, I know what office you're talking about. ones. Yeah. So you can just remove a tile as needed. It's just they're much smaller, so it's going yeah. to take us much more but time. The point to is what matters is internet. Yes. Everything else is secondary. As long as you get yes. good internet and everything is fine. Yeah. And 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 that my wife will agree with me. So 
So she's willing to, you know, make horrible, desperate choices and <laughs> sacrifice things that she once believed in to make sure that she has good internet. Yes. Right? Yeah. Like, like if you know, the internet is down, spare no expense, knock down any wall, pick up any piece of gear, the internet must flow. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, which I don't know, does that say something about us as a, as a modern society? I don't know. I had an argument with a smart light the other day and the smart light won. So, <laughs> Oh God, the automation, the home automation that we have in our house is just terrifying to think about it. Like it's already legacy gear, right? We, we put it in yeah. just a couple of, uh, you know, a year ago and already this stuff, you know, things are no longer supported. Our, our smart sink doesn't do what it's supposed. It's crazy. It's crazy. Anyway, we should do our job. We what should. Is it that we do? I, I don't know anymore. It's it's all okay. I need to hold on. Reveal some windows. Pardon me while I rearrange the screen. We we I think we uh, we 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 all the way home. Um, sorry, <laughs> it's that kind of a day. Yeah. <laughs> I am pressing record on my audio. <laughs> I am pressing record on our video. I've also pressed record. All right. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 704, Juno. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of the Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist. For the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? I, I am doing well. And we, I think I actually forgot to tell you this because sometimes I'm a dumbass. We're nominated for a People's Choice Award for the Sonic Bloom Awards. Right and on. What do we, how, how do we get people to vote early, vote often? So if you go to astronomycast.com, there is a giant banner um it's square it's not that giant um but it says sonic bloom on it click that and it will take you to the voting screen search on astronomy cast they randomize the order so that mm. you aren't always voting for the first one or the last one or anything like that uh so search on astronomy cast and vote so go to astronomycast.com click the banner box thing it's obvious and and vote you can vote this once is in per no email way just address your popularity contest where I'm, podcasts drive their fan base to these things and vote purely based on the momentum of what they're able to generate from the fan this is this is an objective <laughs> objective award about who is the best podcast and it's us it is us. It's always us. We are always the best. I am dropping the link into the Twitch chat to go vote. If you are watching live on YouTube, hopefully someone who's on Twitch can also drop the link into YouTube because I don't have that open. All right. Um, <laughs> so awesome. go vote, please. I'm going to be at the award ceremony. I'm nominated for a Lifetime Achievement Award for Women in Podcasting. And and I'd love to take home two trophies if if be, possible. That'd be amazing. I could bring home zero, but I'm going to Disney World, so it's okay. NASA's Juno spacecraft has completed dozens of flybys of Jupiter, seeing the planet from many angles, and delivering some of the most beautiful images we've ever seen in the Jovian world. NASA is focusing in on Io, sending home images of the tiny volcanic world from 1,500 kilometers away, and the best is yet to come. And we're going to talk about it in a second, but it's time for a break. And we're back. Like the images from NASA's Juno spacecraft have redefined what Jupiter looks like yes. in our kind of modern sense. Like if there is a like an artistic aesthetic quality that Jupiter has, Juno has informed it. It's funny. I see this in like science fiction shows where they're showing gas giant planets yeah. you see images of jupiter in in various things and they're using the juno style of of image to to 
find that. It's it's amazing. Um, so what is Juno? Juno is the first solar powered space probe to go to the outer solar system. And uh, it was placed into a polar orbit, which is the first time that we have placed a planetary explorer into a polar orbit. And it was designed to, as it goes round and round and round, map out the internal structure of Jupiter so we can understand just what's going on in the core of this gas covered thing where all we see is the surface as defined by gravity and meteorology. And along the way, it was also tasked with measuring the ratio of hydrogen to other elements in the atmosphere so that we would know just how much water is locked up in the atmosphere. And there's other stuff like measuring its magnetosphere. And none of this stuff actually requires an imager. <laughs> right. That's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about some of this other stuff first. And then we'll get to the whole imager, yeah. imager controversy. But but first, that idea of using solar electricity yeah. at a at Jupiter. Um, I was researching this at one point, and you need twenty five times as much surface area yes. for your solar panels at Jupiter as you do at Earth. I think yeah. it's like four times as much at Mars and twenty five times as much at Jupiter. And so, really, Jupiter is the the, the last planet that will ever be visited by a solar powered spacecraft. I guess someone's going to make a, I don't know, one with a hundred times. The well, solar so this was made possible by the fact that there are some really amazing advances in solar power going on right now, which, which you're fully aware of because you mm -hmm. have looked at all of this stuff and the, the combination of we are, are getting better at folding things strange comment. Uh, and we're building more and more powerful solar panels, allowed them to build what at the time was the largest solar panels ever constructed. There's three of them attached to Juno. They were able to successfully fold them up, launch them, successfully unfold them, and, and get this spacecraft able to do something we probably couldn't have done if we had to wait for a radiothermal generator to be available because there's just an extremely limited supply of those radioactive isotopes for use in spacecraft. Yeah, and there was a, a dry spell yeah. where the Department of Energy wasn't supplying NASA with the plutonium needed for these radioisotopic thermoelectric generators, like what they've got in Curiosity and Perseverance yeah. and, and and New Horizons. And so any yeah. high power required spacecraft in the outer solar system needs one of these things. And the Juno engineers, realizing that they weren't going to get their RTG, were able to come up with a solution that got the job done using solar electricity with solar panels. And, and that is just... I can just imagine the meeting that went on where it was like, oh, where are we going to get the, the plutonium for this? What, yeah. What if we, we use solar panels? <laughs> right. And that idea is now being used for Europa Clipper as well. And, so, and so what I love is I have had apartments smaller than these solar panels. Right. Uh, each, Big. Yeah. Yeah. Each solar panel is 2.7 meters wide by 8.9 meters long. So that's basically nine feet wide by 27 feet long, roughly, very roughly. There's three of them. And each one yields 168 watts per square meter of electrical power. So it's still like, less power than my apartments used but it's kind of awesome yeah absolutely and so yeah. then let's talk about the science instruments so like what were the you know you you went you listed out a whole laundry list but like what, what are the big science questions that researchers have about jupiter at this point in our so understanding i i have to say my my favorite science question for this mission is what is the internal structure of Jupiter. 
And the reason I'm so fond of this is we've been getting press releases along the lines of Jupiter has a fluffy core. <laughs> where the word yeah. fluffy was was actually used. And and this the spacecraft itself is very much the instrument that was used because as it goes round and round and round, there's an interaction between the gravity, the gravitational force between Jupiter and the spacecraft, its orbit, and the uh, uh, rotational angular momentum uh, and moment of inertia of Jupiter. And, and this has allowed us to determine that the core of Jupiter is significantly larger than we had previously anticipated. And Jupiter probably got smacked by something fairly significant in its history, thus having a lower density core that has been referred to as fluffy insert joke from the comedian you're already thinking about here. Right. But I think like fluffy is not a great description because it's still under immense pressure yes. and density and temperature. Yes. Uh, but it is less dense than you would expect from the traditional ideas of formation of a, of a giant planet like Jupiter. And yeah. so it's still like digesting something yes. that crashed into it billions of years ago. Yeah. And and so so there's also a gravity science instrument. Um, th this one is, is looking at radio waves, um, just trying to figure out what are the the tiny effects that can be seen in the Doppler shifting of signals between Earth and Jupiter. So essentially, as the spacecraft is going round and round, it is communicating with Earth and tiny changes in its velocity due to tiny changes in the gravitational uh, force from the different mass distribution inside Jupiter can get measured this way. We've done the same thing with the moon. It's common to do it with the moon. I love that we did it with Jupiter. Mm -hmm. um, but, but then we have like, we are going to study Jupiter's magnetic field. That is very core to what this mission was doing. So there is both a mag, mag I'm gonna say this wrong, there's a magnetometer. Nicely done. Okay. I had to say it slowly. Yeah. Uh, and a Jovian auroral distributions experiment, which is normally just called Jade, which is much easier to say. And and these these instruments are looking at how Jupiter's magnetic field is structured, how solar particles are interacting with it and creating aurora. And this is providing us a visualization of the space weather at Jupiter, which is something we've talked about here at Earth, but space weather is everywhere in our solar system. And finally, allowing us to get a much more detailed mapping of this massive magnetic field that we know is responsible for magnetic toruses, for interrupting the atmospheres of some of the larger moons. And all of these things are due um, in part to the amazing orbit the spacecraft ended up on. Now, we're going to talk about that camera controversy in a second, but it is time for a break. And we're back. All right, let's talk about the camera. So the original <laughs> plan was no camera. Yes. So so this, this is a low-cost mission. Uh, it's not one of the big flagships like Curiosity is or Europa Clipper is. And, and so in trying to keep costs down and trying to keep things focused on point, there was no big science using visual camera images planned. There was a as last minute as can be made for a spacecraft decision to just add a camera. Mm -hmm. We we have space ready cameras. They're and, small. They're light. They're low power. Yeah, just just do it. And and it was entirely an education and public outreach decision, where the the idea was, uh, and this is in part managed by Candy Hansen, uh, that they were going to allow the public to process images and try and get them combining art and science and understanding uh, 
all the nuances of the atmosphere of Jupiter that could be understood. And oh, wow, we've learned things from yeah. that camera. Yeah. So let's talk about what's in that camera, because it's not just a straight up no. true color camera. It's also dipping into the infrared. So they they so all cameras, to be fair, are going to try to go into the infrared with with just like CCD and CMOS technology. That is is what they are sensitive to. Now, where a lot of the what can the camera see decision comes in, like if if I point my Canon camera at you, I'm not going to be able to see you glowing in the infrared. Right. Um, but if if you remove all of the filters or in particular place a filter on that blocks all of the wavelengths of light that aren't infrared that allows you to start to see things. And with JunoCam, there, there are a variety of different filters that allow you to look at different infrared, optical, and far further into the blue wavelengths coming from Jupiter and put together, well, the brand new images that just came down that triggered us doing this show because I was staring at the images going, oh yes. my God, that's well, so, so amazing. Yeah. Um, folks have been combining the red, green, blue, and near infrared filtered images that are just coming down of, of the moon Io, and we are seeing all sorts of volcano-y goodness. I'm a bit sad that I don't see any active volcanism and I'm hoping that someone looks at these in their full resolution yeah. glory and is like that, that's that's an active caldera. Well, that image, I mean, the, that classic image that we got from New Horizons yeah. when it was doing a flyby of Io and you saw the plume of a volcano yes. rising above the surface of, of Io. But I, I did an interview with one of the researchers behind the images of Io and the research is being done right now. Mm -hmm. He was one of the, he was going to be one of the, the team behind the, the mission to Io, yeah, yeah. which is, you know, was taking a backseat thanks to the Venus missions. And, you know, the, the amount of detail they've got, number of volcanoes they've been able to count. Yeah. It's been quite something. And they're really yeah. excited about that. And, it's doing multiple flies. It did one flyby several months ago. It did an even closer flyby just late last year. It just completed like within a couple of weeks ago, another flyby and it's got a, one more flyby scheduled for February 2nd. And these flybys are getting closer and closer and closer. Yeah. Now they're not as close as the flybys that we got from the Galileo spacecraft like 20 no. years ago, but new instrument, new capability, totally new orbits, different orbit. polar orbit. So you're getting a different set of information that then allows you to add together. And you, you can look at those old images from, from Galileo and then match the volcanoes between the old images and the new images and see how things are changing in size and so on. It's such a dynamic world. It's, it's really amazing. Yeah. Now we're going to talk about this some more in a second, but it's time for another break. Okay. I need to banish the squeaky toy. <laughs> One moment. <laughs> can can you and this this the squeaky toy run away? Yeah. Sorry, I I I'm messaging you. Sorry. <laughs> I, I I have a live viewer, and the dog decided the live viewer was perfect for throwing the dog toy. I'm back. I'm here. I'm sorry. The toy is now gone. Okay. Hey, you have to like dog child proof the studio somehow i so we have a dog gate right but, but the human came in to watch live and the dog gate had already been open because the dog was nowhere near when i started right. recording but the dog spotted an opportunity as as they do, especially especially the ones that like to say throw don't take, and I very much have a dog that is throw don't take. Right, and we're back. So we've got all of these amazing images from Jupiter from Juno, and you know I want to talk go back a bit and sort of talk about that idea of yeah. science because, like, how has NASA worked with the public in sort of 
curating these images? How does this work? So, so the data in its completely raw format is posted on the JunoCam website where there are tutorials and information on how to download it and process it. And folks are encouraged to uh, color map, to uh, adjust, enhance and enhance and change the saturation and the contrast to make things that bring their heart joy, for lack of a better way of describing it. Uh, Kevin McGill, I think I said his name correctly. Kevin Gill. Yeah. Uh, is one of my favorites to follow who does this. There are a whole myriad of people uh, yeah. on Instagram. You can go and tour their sites. And one of the cool side effects of doing this is depending on how you color map and adjust the, the, the saturation and contrast, different kinds of features get drawn out. And so this is where we're really starting to see things like the polar vortices on Jupiter, where you look at the uh, poles of Saturn and you have this weird giant hexagonal structure. You look at the poles of Venus and you see a central vortex. Jupiter is hurricane upon hurricane next to hurricane beside hurricane. Right. And the coloration of the poles it's blues that I never expected from the, the Voyager images that we grew up on, from the Galileo images that informed us when we were early in our career. This is colors and structures I never imagined we'd be seeing. Yeah, it, it's kind of interesting. Like when you think about, say, how your digital camera works, it, you see a color picture, but really it's gathering data yeah. on the red channel, on the green channel, on the blue channel, and then it's merging those as best it can to produce yeah. an image. And when you are doing astrophotography, you can gather images of the sky in whatever wavelengths you have available to you. And so it's as if the Juno camera has can see four colors, it, right? It sees red, blue, green, and a shade of infrared. Yeah. And then whoever is doing the processing on the images can then decide what colors they want to assign to those different colors that the camera mm -hmm. is is doing. You can make it look super realistic yeah. by going with exactly what it would be like if you could get it with the human eye. But as you said, you can you can pull out those infrared features and show how they're interacting in other colors to bring out other things. And there's actually been some science done. Yeah. Um, did you want to talk about that? Um, I'm basically just going to say polar vortex on repeat. So why okay, well, you so, so there was sure, yeah. So <laughs> lead there were, the conversation. <laughs> yeah. So there were essentially weather patterns on Jupiter that astronomers were having a hard time tracking and understanding, and thanks to multiple images being processed by these citizen scientists. The, the scientists started to do these collaborations with the image processors to to track the movements of some of these cloud layers and yes. surface features and we're able to actually produce a bunch of science papers. And so that's sort of the, the sweetest part of this whole thing was a camera that nobody originally thought should be attached to the spacecraft. It, they were convinced to do it for public relations and citizen science and, and just helping to show off the capability of the spacecraft ended up doing science and which nobody had ever expected and yet it's become just an absolute integral part of this mission and and beyond those discoveries another one of the really cool ones is there are some straight out of empire strikes back images of cloud tops where they're discovering that the storm clouds rise far above the average surface of the atmosphere. I don't know the correct words to use here. It's, sure. it's a gas giant. Yeah. But but there are what look like thunderheads rising up above the surrounding atmosphere. And we did not understand just how high up those clouds were rising. And what well, people think great cool. red spot is is a sunken depression. In fact, I remember there was like, yeah, 
art illustrations of a spacecraft passing above Jupiter's great red spot. Maybe Cosmos? Anyway, yeah. in the new Cosmos, I think. But in fact, it's a blo it, it's a bump up. So yeah. it's the it's the inverse that in fact the great red spot is is like a is like a bump on top of Jupiter, not a hole in Jupiter, like a vortex that falls in. Um now what are the plans? I mean, Juno has completed I don't know where they're 54 they're at 50, I believe they're at 57 now. 57 flybys. Yeah. yeah. So what are the future plans for Juno at this point? So so as as we've hinted at, uh, Juno is on a super weird orbit. It actually had some problems with uh, its orbital maneuvering engines. So it originally entered into this extremely elliptical orbit where when it's furthest from Jupiter, it can basically see the whole planet and then it zooms in super close to the surface. And uh, it's going over the poles as it does this. As the orbit rotates, it's getting the chance to do flybys of the different moons. Um, eventually, they're going to realize they can't keep extending the mission. And because we do not want to blight uh, any of Jupiter's moons with our human germs, uh, it's eventually going to have the same fate that Galileo faced. Mm. And it's just going to get plunged into the atmosphere. Oh. I want to see those pictures. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that that fly, like, as you mentioned earlier on, like, because Jupiter's magnetosphere has trapped so much radiation, it's really dangerous for spacecraft to be close to Jupiter. And so this elliptical orbit allows it to catch its breath be yeah. far away from Jupiter and, and plunge in, take a bunch of pictures, gather some science data, and then fly back out, yeah. send the data home, uh, rest. And, and then do the flyby again. But now with its missions, now we're in the, I, I don't know, the yo portion yeah. of this mission. And so now they're sending it really close to Jupiter to go past Io, which is the most radiation struck of the large moons of Jupiter. And so it's going to receive more damage in this region. And hopefully we'll get to a point, as you said, continue to extend. Like it's already had multiple mission yeah. extensions. So so next comes it's whatever will be its final mission extension, including a directed plunge into the atmosphere. And and its orbit actually changes the language that we use. With Cassini, we talked about orbit number blah, orbit number blah. With with this one, with Juno, we talk about perijove numbers because it's the time that it has gotten closest to Jupiter. And, and I just love the fact that they changed the language and acknowledgement of just how different this orbit and this mission's exploration is structured. And I particularly love the fact that they get to alternate between close to full disk and tiny, tiny mm. details. Yeah. The, we've talked about it before. We generally don't get to see the full disk images of these worlds. Um, yeah, it's awesome. And this, and this is the blueprint for yeah. other missions that are going to Jupiter. Uh, the Europa Clipper is going to follow a similar trajectory. It is exploring Europa, but on these really long elliptical orbits. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the um, the Juice mission is going to yes. be doing something similar. So, so you could see that this is the technique. And in fact, the Parker Solar Probe is doing the same thing to visit the sun. It does this gigantic flyby, gets really close, gathers much image, heats up, <laughs> then, and then gets away from the sun again and cools down, yeah. catches its breath and, and, you know, questions its life choices and then falls back into the sun, goes 650,000 kilometers per hour screaming past the sun and then yeah. flies back out again and uh but it's it's really clever because you're always trying to balance like you want a way to have your spacecraft be in the danger zone where the good science is happening and yet you want your spacecraft to last as long as possible and juno nailed it it's it's a great mission we hope that it lives long and has the same experience of cassini as they just keep using it until they're yeah. worried they won't be able to maneuver it i love um, it it's awesome. Go All check right. out Juno Cam's website, folks. Yeah. And there's plenty of people out there who explain to you how to process the images yourself. So if you want to yes. be part of that team, everyone's welcome. Yeah. All yes. right, Pamela. Thank you. And thank you so much to all of our patrons on Patreon. I'm wearing my Patreon hoodie over here. Uh, 
you guys are what allow us to do this show and know that we're going to get edited to sound better than we sound on our own. Um, this week, I would like to thank, and it's awesome seeing new names. I'm so sorry about what I'm about to do to the pronunciation of your names. Um, this week, I would like to thank Thomas Gazzetti, uh, Tushar Nakini, Jarvis Earl, Jeff Collins, Hal McKinney, Olanis Jim, uh, Zebre Lark, uh, Bruno Letts, Jimmy Berger, Bergeron, uh, Jean-Baptiste Le Martinet, Cody Rose, Will Hamilton, Sterling Gray, Adam W., Semyon Torfeson, Mark Schindler, uh, Michael Prochanda, Galactic President Scooper Star McScoops a lot. Thank you. I like it. Um, Astro Bob, John Thays, Jordan Young, Boogie Nut, uh, Stephen Veit, Jeanette Wink, Bora Andre Levsvol, uh, Sege Kemmler, Andrew Palestra, David Trogue, Brian Cagle, Ed, David, uh, Gerald Schweitzer, Buzz Barsak, Zero Chill, Laura Kettleson, and Robert Plasma. Thank you all so much. I enjoy the challenges. Keep them coming. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. <laughs> bye bye. And then they saved. And then they saved. 704. Yup. All right, you create the name when you start the recording. Yes. I always create the name when I finish the recording. It's because we use different software. It's true that. Um, okay. All right, let's see how the my newly upgraded internet connection works now. Let's see. Uploading and done. Okay, for those of you who joined late, I'm going to say it again. We are up for a People's Choice Award. I have dropped the link into Twitch. I'm hoping someone on Twitch can drop the link into YouTube. Uh, go fill out the form once per email address. Select Astronomy Cast. Let the world know we're awesome. Um, yes, I, please. I both really hate People's Choice Awards because it is a who can get the most people to go click a link competition, but also this is the kind of stuff that really we can say to advertisers, hi, we're award winning, and it does help us get ads and stuff like that that help pay the bills. So Zephan said that, I think it was that fan. Yeah, there are suggested concepts for solar power around Saturn too. So I found the paper. Um, and this is a Saturn orbiter mission, Titan Enceladus cycling orbit, would have 335 watts of continuous nominal power, so about the same as Juno, and would have four 7.2 meter diameter arrays. Wow. So, so I'm not sure how, what's the, so 40 meters squared per panel. So it would have 160 square meters of solar panels. Meters in square feet. So, so it would be a 1700 square foot house, the equivalent of a 1700 square foot house. That's big, but it might be the way. Like I think that maybe that's the way. Is is you you know as the this was this paper was written in two thousand and seven. Okay, so technology yeah. is much better now, which means yeah. you can still do that, but add more instruments as a result. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> it's kind of awesome, and yeah. I I just love the advancements in the origami part of of it. there yeah. are rabbit holes you can go down on youtube watching these things get folded and unfolded um so the 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 design in this paper that i'm looking at mm -hmm. I'll, I'll put it on the in the chat is is like the lucy no yeah the lucy ones so so these would these would be like yeah like fan. circles and they would they would fan out yeah from a central point like the lucy ones and th i mean that kind of i mean it it worked but but one of the one of the panels didn't completely open up so yeah clearly there's more work needed to make that be successful but <clears throat> but then i well, wonder like, what would it take to do one at uranus 
Cause... And space is hard. And I feel okay saying that absolutely any design can fail periodically. Yeah. Yes, of course. Uh, everything fails. Yeah. Life's pain. Um, all right. Let's get some questions. Uh, Lionel KJ7 welcome to Lionel, says, for the post show, can we talk about how sad the apparent mostly failure of the Peregrine, Fal Peregrine Probe is? So have you been following this? I, I caught the vaguest thing on the news today, but then I was prepping for this show. Yeah, so we got the first launch last late last night. We got the first launch of United Launch Alliance's Vulcan rocket, and this mm -hmm. is their planned competition to Falcon Nine. Yeah, I fell where... asleep while the launch was going on. <laughs> right, I didn't even watch. Um, <laughs> I literally late. fell asleep yeah, with you... my phone open. Yeah, I woke was, up later, was... and I was like, "What on earth is on my?" Yeah, phone it was. Open? must have been like what uh 12 30 and it was the planned window and it ended yeah. up not launching a little after that so yeah you would have been up in the middle i, went, I was yeah. up in the middle of the night and fell asleep with it and on, fell on my phone right yeah. okay um but so the plan with vulcan and if you want i've done an interview with tori bruno who is just a total party um yeah. and and we talk about the vulcan what the plans are but essentially they're trying to reuse their rocket with the most expensive parts first. So they've got these, they've, they're gonna be reusing the the boosters, they're gonna be reusing the engines. They, they've they subcontracted out their engines. The, they used to use Russian engines. Not but now an they're option using, now. Not an option. And so now they're using, and the timing is really good. So they're using yeah. Blue Origin BE4 engines to power okay. this thing. And you know, before Blue Origins even launched a new gland, got you've got these engines being used on on a vulcan and over time they're going to be saving like I, I think everything was disposed on this one but the plan is they're going to catch the engines with helicopters and you know the the fuel tanks that the main part will be destroyed and they're going to try and hit that sort of sweet spot of reusability with this rocket but they mm -hmm. absolutely nailed their window like the first the first launch of this rocket and they nailed every part of it that's awesome but it looks like there's a problem with the astrobotic peregrine lander on the spacecraft and so this is carrying a mix of commercial and government payloads on board it's gonna it's got some nasa payloads on board and it, the goal is that it was gonna be the first u.s commercial lander it was gonna land down on the moon bring all and so now instead of nasa trying to design and build landers for the moon they just pay freight to have their experiments delivered to the lunar surface. Now, and so, oh, go ahead. I, I know that there had been some controversy because they were originally planning to have a ride share with human remains that were going to be put on the moon and the Navajo Nation uh, at, did like whatever the moral equivalent of an injunction is. Yeah, yeah. I haven't been following that story too too deeply. I did see some news reports on this, and I'm not exactly okay. sure. Like, is is it the the concern about there being human remains on the moon? Yeah, hmm. Be because okay. it's it's a holy site for them. Right, right. Um. So yeah, I'm mean, I, you know. It's the, is it Celestis? Anyway, there's, so yeah, there's a bunch yeah. of, and so maybe this problem is not going to be an issue. And so it, one of the first things it was supposed to do was fire its propulsion system, turn itself towards the sun to start getting electricity into its solar panels. And that seems to have failed. And so now we're waiting to find out if they can recover this, they can get the energy and they're going to need to have that propulsion system online for doing their lunar insertion for being able to land on the moon. So, so this is potentially a, a big problem for this lander. Yeah. Well, I'm just glad that we have another functional rocket nowadays because there's been ah. so many different kinds of rockets where we're like, okay, they can only do one more. They can only do four more depending on which rocket it was because no. We were relying on Russian engines and Ukrainian tanks for so many different systems. And that particular war took out both supply chains. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I, like the problem that you have right now is that SpaceX is just 
walking away with the entire launch market. <laughs> that <I> mean, too. <laughs> right. I mean, they launched close, just shy of 100 yeah. launches last year. Now, most of them were Starlinks, but maybe in the 40s of commercial launches. And they're gobbling up every, you know, every NASA. F they, they launched next 37B on a Falcon Heavy. They've been doing... Um, just tons and tons of launches with all the different spacecraft. Yeah. You've got uh, the... China's going to be doing a launch for ESA and... I uh, heard that. Yeah. Um, huh. Yeah, let me see if I can... Yeah, so I mean, ch so China is running a very close second to SpaceX. Yeah. They're launching... They launched in the high 70s. Like... And they're building out their own version. They've been testing out their own version of a uh, global uh, internet satellite mm -hmm. service. Uh, they've got their own versions of weather satellites and all that, right? They're they're yeah. they're building essentially a parallel. They've got a ton of science uh, spacecraft, Earth Earth observation satellites and stuff that's going on. Plus, they're doing all the resupply missions to their space station. Yeah. Plus, they're doing their upcoming lunar landers, and they're in the process. They've redesigned their crew capsule they've released designs for their lunar lander they're building a super heavy lift rocket that will carry both of those to the moon which it, i think is actually a much more elegant solution than what nasa has planned yeah yeah um, so the einstein probe is launching on a long march 2c really yeah isn't that i didn't that know cool? that yeah. yeah that's really that's really interesting okay like i really wish the the countries would get over their issues with each other, learn to collaborate. Lisa's doing cooperate. it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, as as Canadians, I think we're not we're not bound by the same I forget what the name it is. There's a military requirement that ITAR. will not allow ITAR, yeah. And it won't allow any American company to work with a Chinese company in spaceflight. And so yeah. they're just you're locked out. Chinese astronauts can't come to the International Space Station. And so the Chinese built their own and now they're inviting the world to come to their station. Um, and you're going to see astronauts from other countries fly there. Uh, we and have then a super cool question coming in that's related to this from Twitch. Sure. Veronica Cure asks, can you imagine space traffic control? Yes. It, it, well, so... So it kind of exists. So the way space traffic control works is with the, with all of the monitoring of space debris. Like NORAD yeah. does this, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's. But, but like currently it's different operators getting on the phone with each other. And, and there isn't that global central yeah. authority. COSPAR tries to register everything through an agreement with the United Nations. But. There, there isn't any enforcement the way there is with air traffic control, where yeah. you will, by God, do X, Y, and Z if you're flying an airplane. But we don't quite have that for orbital maneuvers yep. yet. Your camera is shaking. Oh, sorry. It's it's because it's mounted to the desk, and I am talking and, and touching the desk okay yeah. sorry yeah. backed away backed away yeah. i would be less enthusiastic <laughs> back away, back away. Well, you can be as enthusiastic as you need to <laughs> just back away from the desk yes yes um uh but yeah yeah so there you go so i mean there is room for hundreds of thousands of satellites to do in low earth orbit around the earth if you stick to highly regulated zones and like the sun do doesn't misbehave and sure but you i mean you account for the sun but the point okay. is like like airplanes follow flight corridors like boats like if you're shipping goods across the atlantic ocean if you're going to from the u.s to europe you go along one shipping lane and if mm -hmm. you're coming from europe to the u.s you follow a different shipping lane like train tracks so there is none of this coordination everybody just says I'm going to launch. Is that okay? And the FAA goes, well, I don't see any problems with your communication. It's not going to, it's not going to cause damage to somebody's house. Yeah. So sure, go ahead. And, but we're getting to a point now where you do need that coordination yeah. between nations that there needs to be a globally agreed upon 
this is where spacecraft fly if they're going in this direction at this altitude. And that's where they fly if they're going in that direction at that altitude. And you have space in all dimensions. And then there's yeah. space is big. Well, and it also affects, affects takeoff. There was a moment a few years ago where I had a good laugh at the ridiculousness of it because a launch was last minute delayed, not because of boat in zone, not because of error with rocket, not because lightning within the designated region, but because there was a satellite passing overhead that they hadn't accounted for. Um, it's this kind of wildness. I mean, can you imagine the statistical improbability of launching straight into another satellite? But this is now a concern. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and the various satellites are having to do minor adjustments all the time to avoid yeah. one another. Yeah. And the impacts are just getting more and more likely over time. And there was like someone had done a paper about the sustainability of law. And we've, we are currently yeah. the amount of stuff that's being launched is unsustainable, that it is an inevitable sort of more and more collisions happening over time. I forget yeah. what the number is. And it's not very many. It's like 10 launches a year or something to remain sustainable for the amount of, of satellites that are then deorbiting and clearing out the debris. So yeah. somebody needs to, you know, the world needs to sit down and plan out where satellites can fly. And there's no, like, you can't back away from this. Like once you've defined it, it's not like you can have, you can, yeah. you can't close your airspace. Once the satellites are, you know, once there is a row of satellites going over your country, that's done. There's uh -huh. no stopping them. Uh -huh. So, well, there is, but then you end up with the Kessler syndrome. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 You just smash them instead. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a, that's a, that would be a very bad day. So, well, we've reached the end of our hour. Uh, man, it was so much fun to come back glorious. and do Economy Cast. Uh, and what a great topic. So, what are you working on? What, what should people keep an eye out for? Um, so, we are getting ready to release later this week, uh, season two, episode 11 of Escape Velocity Space News. We're doing a closer look at the Earth's mag uh, magnetic field and how it's changed over time and the weird and wild ways we're detecting that. Um, one of my favorite realizations I've ever spontaneously made is Santa Claus can totally live at the magnetic North Pole because it goes through land. So Santa is not at the rotational North Pole. Mm. That's water. You can't go there. He's at the magnetic North that makes Pole. Sense. And now well, you know. Well, there you go. Um, and I then, lied to my children then. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this coming weekend, I'm going to be at Arija in Boston. It is a science fiction fantasy convention. Ali Pelfrey, our video editor, will be traveling with me. Um, I am going to cosplay the entire weekend. So look for me as a Viking, a walrus, and uh, outer space. You That's will cool. know that one when you see it. Um, I just booked flights for april eclipse so where are you going texas. going okay. to texas cool um and my voice is back and so i'm going to be doing my question show again i haven't done it in a month so i oh. hope i still remember where space is <laughs> um and the biggest thing is that nasa's NIAC grants were awarded earlier this week late last Ooh. week and that is like that's that's wild and crazy awesome for stuff. Us. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm we're in the process of doing a whole bunch of stuff on Universe Today about the different NIAC grants. I'm going to be trying to interview everybody involved with it. Uh, we're going to do a video about it. Yeah, this is sort of like a full court press from us to cover the NIAC grants, which is so much fun every year. And that's sort of become our that's become our thing that we your that coverage we do all this of the coverage. NIAC is what I look forward to. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's going to be so much fun. And there's a lot of great ideas. And it's there's so many familiar names now that I can, it's very easy for me to just go, hey, can I interview on this one? They're yeah. like, yeah, no problem. Like, it's, it's, it's nice to be, to have enough history now with these people that yeah. I'll be able to talk to them. All right. Well, again, we've reached the end of our hour. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us here on the show. Thanks in advance to our editors, both video and audio, for having to deal with the mess that we're about to drop on your plate. <laughs> Welcome. And uh, we will see all of you next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. And now I 